Okay, good morning. This is session 18, part A of the course on mathematical signal processing. And we have finished last time with a quick uh, comment on the continuous version of the norm. So this is both a way to understand better how things are working and also the historical approach, approach so to say. I was first interested to decompose the Fourier transform into equal pieces because this is something that you can do on a general locally compact group, abelian group, um, unlike the dyadic decompositions which are relevant for wavelets. And then I realized that the norm is not translation invariant. I will maybe even show you some examples of how, how and why it's not exactly translation invariant. But if you translate a function, maybe a bump function, it may sit, maybe you take the Wiener norm. You take the maximum of a bump function sitting in the block, it has norm one. You move it around, it splits, and the norm is suddenly are going up to two or three and then going down. But it's oscillating and it's, so it's, you could take the supremum over all the norms of all the translates, but it's already too complicated. I found it much more convenient to use a continuous norm and uh, in order to do it unified uh, in a unified way, I just say, let's assume that we have one norm, uh, which is either the sup norm for C0 or the Fourier algebra norm, or later you can take more general things. And let's try to say, we want to control the function by something like a sliding window. But instead of taking a, a Fourier transform of the local pieces as it's done in the spectrogram, we just measure each piece. Of course, it's very close actually to this idea. So we take a bump function phi, we move it along. So the control function of the function or signal distribution F at the position set, something that depends of course on what you measure, that's the signal F, the way how you localize, that's the bump function of phi, typically non-zero, positive, symmetric around zero, maybe normalized, and how you measure the, the local part, and that's in our case, the FL1 norm. So this is a continuous way of measuring the function, and I think it's clear that if you shift a function, then you will measure the same thing at, at the shifted position. So it's almost like convolution that it commutes, but it's not addit uh, additive, of course. It's only sub-additive. And then we can take a define a continuous norm by integrating this control function, which is non-negative anyway, over the whole uh, Euclidean space or over the whole group. So you can say it's the L1 norm of some intermediate function that you are controlling it. Now, I have to realize, I realize that when I'm giving so many detailed explanations that it may be, uh, everything may be look cumbersome or so. So I will not um, do any more such details, but I have tried to write it down. So somehow the idea is that uh, when you control this, the question is, how does this norm, is it the norm? And how does it depend on the choice of the bump function? And uh, how does it compare to this decomposition with the bupu? And now the idea is, if we take a large plateau function phi, then you measure the individual contribution, which is measured by a partition of unity quite for a long time. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, if you are changing the phi to a shifted version of the phi or a sum of shifted version of the phi or a limit of sums of the, then you still can control it. So um, we are, I'm just telling you that this is uh, the, the uh, correct way to do it. And, uh, or you can replace it and you can check the details or so. Um, but once you have it, uh, then you, we can, yeah, so he, he, maybe this part, for example, we're saying, well, if you can do it with phi, you can also do it with phi absolute squared. Why? Because the control function with respect to phi uh, is dominating up to some factor, the, um, the function with phi squared. Now, if you have a replace phi by phi squared, you get the positive function. Now then you can take shifted positive functions, actually you can take a limit of shifted functions, so you can multiply it with a plateau function. But we all know that if you have a huge plateau, 
and you are convolving it with a normalized function phi, which means that it's uh, essentially looks like a small function, small supported function from the distance, then you're getting uh, effects in, in the middle and the, the boundaries of the plateau, but in the middle, in the inside, it's everything is fine. So maybe I'm just concentrating on, on this part here. If you convolve a plateau function, which is constant on a huge, large plateau, then you're writing this integral or so. Uh, but you're only, um, if, if your argument is inside the plateau, uh, you find yourself <clears throat> that all the possible arguments are arguments where that original plateau function P is constant one. And therefore you're left with the integral over phi hat squared. And if you assume that this is a function which has L2 norm one, then you get constant one. So more or less any bump function with compact support multiplied with a huge plateau function gives you a function which is has maybe some side lobes, but it's getting a sufficiently small plateau function. Now with the plateau function, uh, that's another important part here, we get this geometric thing that you give me a localized piece described in the pupu norm. And then I'm saying, well, I'm measuring this piece for quite a while. My plateau function phi moving is reproducing this part. And then we need the algebra property of the, of the space A. F psi k is of course, if you multiply it out, is the norm of F psi k uh, times, in this case, uh, we, we switch the order. We write this is F times T set phi, and we pull this out and the psi k is viewed as a multiplication effect and it is controlled by the psi k a. But uh, if you do this uh, and you sum up such a thing, then you can say if this is true for a fixed k and for the set, which is in the area of k. So of course, while we are moving our window over the position relevant for the piece, which is living at lattice point k, we are having such an estimate. So if I take this here and I sum up over all the case, which means on the left hand side, I'm taking the Bupu norm. I can of course say, well, on the right hand side, I can take the sum over these integrals. So uh, I should have written the integral also because we are integrating over a set of volume one. So it's just one and one is written as an integral of something like this. But here you see it's an integral over pieces at all these lattice points. And therefore we get, uh, um, I'll just note, uh, this is to be corrected. I get uh, the whole integral. So this is a statement that says, if you give me, or if I'm allowed to choose a large plateau function, then I can control the Bupu norm by uh, the integral, so the continuous control function with respect to a large plateau function. Of course, the other part was, the beginning was, I can control for some small plateau function, the, the continuous norm by the amalgam norm, so by this pupu. But the other trick was to replace small plateau functions or small control functions, small windows, by shifted versions, by linear combinations, by big plateau functions, so at the end, we are completely free to choose our function as we want it. Actually, we don't have to restrict our attention to functions phi, which have compact support. If we take any function as zero, it will be added up by pieces of bump functions, which are going to zero and adding up in an absolutely convergent way. So for the application, it will be very important that we can even take the Gauss function here. So this is, another uh, way that if you take this continuous norm, we can take the Gauss function. Now, the next and important step is to see how we can um, use this to connect with the representation of a zero and the definition as it is given in the most of the recent articles and also mostly in the book of Charlie Grechenick on foundations of time frequency analysis. So why didn't I simply choose this approach? Because I didn't want to say, well, you all know L2, we have had a course on Lebesgue integration and you know functional analysis. So I really wanted to build everything from scratch. But 
kind of I have to connect, of course, my approach to the one that you find in the literature. So we look at the continuous function and now we specialize. We choose uh, the L FL1 norm, the norm in the Fourier algebra. And so I, this is an important part. So I, I kind of guide you step by step through this one. Now, uh, what does it mean that I have to say, we take this local piece, we localize the F with respect to the window. Now I'm switching to the standard notation of maybe think of a Gaussian window or a L1 function, which is controlling this. So you localize and then you take the Fourier algebra norm, which means you take the Fourier transform. This is a well-defined thing and the L1 norm. So typically, uh, I think it's slater in the text, uh, it's assumed that F and G are L2 functions. So the short time Fourier transform is well-defined for a window G in L2 uh, and for a signal F in L2. The point is that in this case, you can be sure that F multiplied with the shifted window. So it's a product of two L2 functions is in L1. So the classical version of the Fourier transform would apply. Now, what does it mean to take the Fourier transform? It means you take an integral and then you take an absolute value. And of course, uh, we can introduce now the standard notation of a spectrogram. I mean, it's there are two different things. We This V stands for voice transform or window or sliding window short time Fourier transform. So we will talk about G as the window or the Gabor atom later on. So we could say that's the definition of the short time Fourier transform. We have a sliding window G and at every position T in time, we take a Fourier transform, which is a function of S. And the standard way of displaying it is of course to say, well, we move time horizontally from left to right, and then the vertical direction is the S parameter. So we are getting a function in the complex domain, if you want so, so actually this is going into the theory of Fox spaces. So for the case that you start to use a Gauss function, you really get a function on the complex plane, which is analytic in the sense of complex analysis. But this is not what we will use. I mean, it's very, very interesting because it's giving very deep mathematical results, but we just take a naive approach. We window the function and we do the free transform by writing out the integral. So it's the e to the minus two pi i and s is the frequency. And so we have a function of two variables. Now, if I go back, this is just the definition now. And then uh, we could rewrite it and then say, well, we have now uh, uh, an integral over this function as a function of two variables and uh, thinking of the complex plane of a Gaussian plane, I'm writing set. So we are saying for every function f and you fix, give me a window or I choose a window, I can create the short term Fourier transform and this is a function of the plane and then that one should be integrated. So it's the L1 norm. So this is uh, the usual definition. This is the L1 norm of the function is, the, is an equivalent norm and this has certain advantages. So I will first uh, skip this here. I will demonstrate it here. Uh, yeah, here is the argument with Cauchy Schwartz. I just want to tell you that you can also write it as a scalar product. So if you go back, oh, that was too fast. If you go back to the definition here, then you can say, no, it's not a, a localized version of the function, but it's a function uh, with a scalar product against another function. So you make a conjugation. Now, um, very often this conjugation is dropped because people prefer to take real valued windows. So if you take a real valued window, I can say this is really a scalar product. Otherwise you have to put the G bar and then you have a conjugation. And then you say it's a modulated version of the shifted window. So uh, the minus is coming from the conjugation and uh, that allows you to write this uh, short time free transform as a time frequency shifted G. 
We also have to be careful, and I want to mention this distinction to some of the parts in the book of Charlie Grochenik. He talks about time frequency shifts when he is having an operator of the form T followed by MS as symbols. I like to choose the order of operators. So, you know, in matrix multiplication, you have A, convol a multiplied with B means first you apply the B and then you apply the A. So it's the same here. First, I'm doing a time shift, then I do a frequency shift. Now, there is a commutation relation discussed very often that you can change the order. Uh, and that uh, means that you get a phase factor. So very often, and especially when you just take the absolute values of the short time Fourier transform, it doesn't matter whether you do a time frequency shift or a frequency time shift. Uh, and so uh, we, we don't have to spend a lot of time on, on discussing this aspect. So uh, the theorem that we can say uh, is, uh, again, I have to do some correction, is the following. We can characterize for any nice function. Here I put it in the mathematical terminology, some Schwartz function or some L1 function, which has a free transform, which is compactly supported. So a band limited L1 function, or you take actually anything from a zero, but we shouldn't use it in as part of the assumption. So anything decent, then we can say that we are starting from L2, then uh, the short term free transform is well defined. And we assume that this is in L1 of the time frequency plane. So we call this phase space or time frequency plane. And if I put a head, it simply means uh, it should be viewed as the parameter space for the frequency variable. Of course, this uh, defines a norm and each non-zero window from this class of good windows defines the same space and gives an equivalent norm. And the most important argument why this is a good description is the fact that we have for the Gauss function, a very interesting relationship, namely that the free transform can be viewed as a rotation. That, that's really, uh, I should maybe, maybe park it in, mark it in red. So why is it true? Well, the Gauss function, the classical Gauss function e to the minus pi x squared is Fourier invariant. So you should have a Fourier transform of the Gauss function here, but it's not necessary because of the good properties of the Gauss function. And then you see, if you take the spectrogram of the uh, of the of the short of the free transform of your signal, uh, then it's essentially the same as the original. Yeah, you can change forward or inverse free transform. It's just a rotation by 90 degree. So in MATLAB we can do experiments. For example, we can say, well, we know that the delta goes to a pure frequency, and the pure frequency goes to a delta or so. And clearly delta is a vertical strip. You have all the frequencies at the same time at a given moment. And the pure frequency is a horizontal line. And so you can imagine how, it, how this is going, not only for the Dirac's, but for general measures. So let me discuss, so to say that's now the classical approach. And uh, we have just established that this is equivalent once you are familiar with L2. So one of the main properties is, of course, this so-called commutation relationship, which means that uh, you can change the order of translation and modulation and you get a phase factor. Well, uh, here is the proof. And it's maybe an exercise in concentration on, on these symbols, but uh, it should also tell you that using this operator notation, and I really recommend it also if you're teaching courses to, to make use of these things instead of writing integrals, doing substitutions and integrals, this is what you really do here. So I'm saying, well, what is a time shift followed to a frequency shift uh, on the function f? Well, I can only describe it by the value of this new, some new function on the value x. Okay, what does it mean to do a modulation? I multiply m with a character, chi s, with a pure frequency, and then I insert the argument x minus t. Of course, I can do it separately. And you see here, 
The difference between the opposite thing is first you shift the function and you only multiply with a pure frequency, but here you are first multiplying, so you're shifting the pure frequency also. But of course, we know that there's an exponential law, and that means the frequency is an eigenvector for translation operator, or you just apply it, you get chi s of minus t, and what is left over is chi s of x of f of t of x. Now, this, of course, is, you would read, this is the x shifted, oh, no, uh, yeah, I, think, I think I should I have made an error. Yeah, of course, here is a typo. It should be x minus t. I mean, if you look, copy from the left, so it's x minus t. So we have the t shifted version of f at the point x, and that's multiplied. And so you get this extra factor, which is, of course, exactly e to the minus 2 pi i. And so, and that's the, the argument. Okay, so this is a proof of this relationship. This is true for every x, therefore it's true for these, as for the operators applied to any f, and therefore it's true for this operator. So this is an operator identity. Now, the argument for this important relationship that rotation of the spectrogram is what you see as an effect of the Fourier transform, is uh, based on Planchel's theorem. And now you see how strong, useful Planchel is also in this context. We, we start uh, in the opposite direction. So Vg of f at t of s is by definition or by the characterization, a scalar product of f against the time frequency shift of your window. Now Planchel tells you that you can take both objects to the Fourier transform side. So I take f to f hat, and this is going to g hat. But when you say I got a modulated version, we remember, okay, so that's now probably, probably I, I have to correct it, yeah. So a full transform of a modulated version should be a shifted version. So yeah, that probably, I was already observing a, a difference to the, to the, Book of Gorkinik, yeah. So here is my, my mistake, which I will correct in the in the notes. So the outer thing is the modulation, which goes into translation. The inner was a translation, which goes to a modulation with minus t. Okay, then uh, I have to shift the order. You see, the free transform changes the order of translation and modulation. Therefore, I have to revert it. I get a phase factor. And then I have to write the arguments back in the right way. So probably my story is uh, telling you, you should take a rotation by 90 degree in one direction. And in reality, I should do it in the opposite direction. Maybe I should have started with the free transform here. And, but I think you see, it's a good exercise. I'm not doing anything magic except going to the free transform with the Planchel theorem and using some identities which you have to check by hand, but I was a little bit too fast when I was writing it up. Okay, another very important thing is uh, the covariance property. So somehow um, we could now play a song and say, well, you see this part of the melody is repeating itself a little bit later, but at a higher tune or, so uh, taking the same melody, played a little bit later at a higher or lower frequency is of course depicted in the spectrogram. And now I'm using the word spectrogram in a slightly different way by saying very often people would say they take the uh, this short time Fourier transform absolute squared because this is really what we plot. So I would say in my MATLAB experiments, most of the time I take the absolute value of the short time Fourier transform it shows you where you have big absolute values, small absolute values. And why I'm doing this, because the frequency, the, the real and imaginary part are usually not very nice. They may have big oscillatory terms and therefore visualization, a complex valued function of two variables is not possible anyway. You, you would need a four dimensional imagination. So it's nice, reasonable to take the, the, um, the, uh, to take the absolute value squared. We also have uh, observed, maybe I'm, I'm coming to this about the energy distribution. So uh, just uh, take a look at this formula. 
if you take uh, the short time Fourier transform of a time frequency shifted version, and you see here I was copying from the book of Charlie Grochenik, so he writes time shift first, frequency first, then you get a phase factor with a translation. So this is a short argument as, as it is uh, being given, as, as it has been done and just above. Now, if you take the absolute value, this phase factor disappears and you just have a shift parameter, which I wrote here. So the spectrogram now in the sense of energy distribution uh, of a time frequency shifted version, and you can take a frequency time shift, whatever you like, is just a shift of the spectrogram. So the same melody at a different position in the score. Now, an important thing uh, that we need also for this is the reconstruction formula. So can I reconstruct my function from the original, from the spectrogram? Because later on we will try to reconstruct it from uh, the spectrogram, from samples of the spectrogram. And here we have this very important uh, orthogonality relationship. So we are talking now the most general case about two short, short time free transforms with window G1, G2 and signals F1, F2. And then uh, the story is the scalar product of two such short time free transforms. Uh, they are not just only, they will we'll see they are square integrable, but they're also bounded and continuous. But the, the scalar product is the product of the two scalar products, you take the windows, either you change the order and you write G2 with G1, no bar, or I wrote, keep the order G1 with G2, but uh, the windows are on the right-hand side of the scalar products, both of them, that's why you get the conjugation here. And then you take the scalar product of this here. So the application case will be, well, take the same window G1 equals G2, maybe the Gauss function, which is normalized in the L2 sense, then you have here the L2 norm of the window squared, which is one. So you have a nice mapping, which is isometric, which maps the function into the time frequency plane. So it's also maybe interesting to say, well, if you have a normalized function, then Plauschel tells you that the energy, which is typically taken to be the integral over the function over time, absolute squared. So take f of t absolute squared, integrate, get the energy viewed in the time sense. Or you take Plancherel, you do the same with the Fourier transform, you integrate the Fourier transform absolute squared, and then you get the total energy. So Plancherel is saying the energy is preserved. And what you see here is you get an energy distribution uh, in, the, in the plane and phase space. So it's not only that you know when things occur, so kind of, when it's loud or when it's silent in an audio signal, or if a piece of music is played in a certain tune, which frequency are significant represented in the piece, but without time information. But the spectrogram tells you exactly when you have this concentration. You can also say, well, let's take the absolute value squared. And then uh, if you have an L1, a two function with integral, L2, with L2 norm one, then this absolute value square is an integral which also has one. So you can say the spectrogram in the sense of the absolute squared, which we see above here, uh, is a probability distribution. 100% is everything is the whole signal, but you would like to know that 20% are living in a certain region, in a certain band, in a certain uh, strip of the time frequency plane. Okay, so this will be an important uh, statement and it will help us to do the reconstruction formula. But before uh, doing this, I will uh, show you, uh, hopefully if it works, a small uh, GeoGebra experiment. And uh, I put only the graph into the slides, but um, Again, um, maybe I'm, I should ask whether you can see it. I hope it's okay. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I explained to you that I have a random trigonometric polynomial. I took a constant one plus a few cosine terms with frequencies three and five. I mean, I didn't even care with the two pi or so. 
And um, okay, I think it's, it's visible. And then uh, I realized that I should take uh, uh, a, a window which is broad enough so that locally I have significant uh, contribution. So the alpha is something, a value which is relatively small, which means I take a long window. In the STX program, you can choose the length of the window to be uh, expressed in terms of samples or microseconds or so. Now, the nice thing is I have here a translation parameter. And if I shift it, uh, you see how this window is shifting. And uh, there is the nice possibility of doing an animation. And so I hope that you can see now the animation. So what is the short time Fourier transform doing? It is taking this signal, it's a simple-minded signal, it's localizing it, so the brown curve at each time instance, so B is now my time parameter, it is undergoing a Fourier analysis. And you can imagine if in some part of the piece of music you hear a certain tone, it will say this tone is significant here. And later on, there is maybe nothing, and later on, there's another tune. There is an organ playing with a lot of uh, frequencies playing or a flute, which is very well concentrated or so. So we are localizing and this allows us to do a Fourier analysis, a local Fourier analysis of, of things which are changing over time. And somehow in retrospect, one must say, think of all the recordings that we are sharing nowadays Think of the MP3 coder, which is really going to the short, short time, which takes the, these Fourier transforms, throws away insignificant frequencies, but of course this changes over time. Uh, this is a much more natural way to deal with non-periodic signals. I must say that if I read uh, engineering uh, comments, I see very often the statement that real life signals are square integrable because they have finite energy. And I very often think, well, this is not really true. Also, it's a wrong perception that a signal is either non-periodic and well decaying, like an L2 function, or that it has to be periodic. It may be kind of periodic locally with different periods changing over time. And this is what a short-term Fourier transform is allowing you to do. Now, uh, I would like to uh, go next for the reconstruction formula because I think this is a very important formula. And uh, instead of giving all the details, I will tell you this is an abstract, as an abstract principle behind it, which can be explained also relatively easily, even with MATLAB for matrices, but I give you the description in the set of, in setting of Hilbert spaces. So, once we have this, um, we will do this uh, later on the proof. Once we have this isometric embedding, we are saying, well, these highly oscillatory signals are potentially highly oscillatory signal in L2 of the real line is going into a square integrable function, which is continuous, but also having the same L2 norm in the Hilbert space L2 of the plane. So these are the two Hilbert spaces and we have this Inmersion, which is the voice transform, the short-term Fourier transform, which is isometric. And then the claim is, how can we invert it? Well, we just take the conjugate operator. So the story is uh, quite simple. <clears throat> yeah, maybe I, I should tell you, there is a slight difference between a joint operator and conjugate operator. The joint for the case of matrices, complex matrices is the transpose matrix, whereas the uh, conjugate, that's kind of maybe not universal terminology, is the transpose conjugate. So uh, in the abstract setting, you're just saying, well, if you're saying I take scalar products of vectors Y, uh, then I can move this operator T, which is mapping uh, X1, in the Hilbert space H1 into X2. So Y is in the second Hilbert space. So if you give me an element in the first Hilbert space, move it over to the bigger Hilbert space, and then you can take an H2 scalar product or so. But then the claim is, 
this conjugate operator applied to the y, so this is now moving from the second Hilbert space back to the first, is the same as, um, as the scalar product here. So, um, and if this mapping, so this is the definition of what is the conjugate operator. It's an easy task to say, well, this is a defining a bilinear form, and therefore there must be some new vector, and I call it t star of y. And this t star of y is depending in a linear way on the input y, and therefore you can call it an operator. So now the claim is that if this embedding is isometric, then we can say uh, that the adjoint of the conjugate operator is the inverse operator. And the trick is at the moment, maybe it's just a purely formal one that you're saying, okay, I assume that we have this isometric property. I start with the X and the H1 norm squared. This is just the scalar product of X with X. And I write the T of X as a scalar product of T of X now, of course, in H2 squared. So this equation squared is exactly this here. And now I'm saying, well, but if I have a T at some argument on the right-hand side, I can move it over. So the isometric property tells you that this identity has to be valid for every X in H1. Now the polarization principle, uh, which I don't discuss separately here, but it uh, should be um, familiar to you, allows you to express scalar products due to the parallelogram law as linear combination of certain products. Remember, this is true for every x. So you can take any vector, maybe I should have written y here, for every vector y, for example, if I want to get this here, it must be true for x plus set, x minus set, x plus i times set, x minus set. And if you do a smart linear combination of these terms, you can express the scalar product. And then you get this is true for every x and every set. Now, if this is true for every set, it means in a coordinate system or in an abstract way, it means that the first has, the side has to be equal. So it means T star T, which is a well-defined operator. T is moving from H1 to H2. T star is moving back from H2 to A1. So this is an operator from H1 to H1 must be X for every X. So it's the identity operator. So this is the inverse, but we have to be careful. It's the inverse on the left. I was thinking and suggesting actually we could do it also if there's time later on. Take the as a prototype example the embedding of the plane into the three-dimensional space. So put a piece of paper on your table and then uh, put it somewhere into the into the physical three-dimensional space uh, or leave it on the table then it means well it has two coordinates, but I say uh, the table has set equals zero, the xy plane. And so if you write this as the matrix T, it is a three by two matrix. If you, if you take the transpose conjugate, you're getting exactly the identity operator. And I was emphasizing that you have to keep the order. It's just the left inverse on the range. So for every element of the form T of x, which means in the xy plane, it, the T star is just bringing you back. It's just throwing away the zero more or less in this particular case. Um, but uh, it's, um, yeah, uh, get, the order can be chosen, changed. And then of course you get a three by three matrix. And then the question is, what is the product T with T star? And it turns out to be exactly the projection operator. It projects on the range. So it's T, T star is again, of course, you can multiply it by itself. So it's T, T star, T, T star. The inner term is giving the identity. So it's an idempotent. If you change the order, it's self adjoint. So it must be a projection operator. And it's very natural that, of course, if you're embedding a small space into a big space, you get a closed subspace. And for every closed subspace, there is an orthogonal projection. So it's a very nice thing uh, to have. Now, uh, I would like to, maybe I try to do it uh, quickly. In the book of Charlie Grokenick, you find a proof for this, for the fact that the voice transform is actually an isometric embedding, uh, but it requires a little bit of vector valued integration. And so I had to redo it 
So what you see here is a new proof that I have only devised or designed uh, in the last few uh, couple of days. So uh, the left hand side is the uh, in the claim is the L2 norm of the short time Fourier transform. So we want to show that it's isometric. And uh, for simplicity, I'm using now window K, which uh, I'm doing it first for compactly supported windows. It's just a matter of convenience to assume it's flip invariant, so it's an even function and it's normalized so that it's really expected to be an isometric embedding. So what is the square of the short time Fourier transform? Well, we, uh, the, the first thing we need here is that we, we want to show that, yeah, okay, that this identity is valid. So I call it left inside of this identity. So this is an identity which I claim to be true. And uh, so what is the left inside? Well, you're writing that integral as um, a convolution. So it's a squared, so it's, it's a convolution. And because k is positive, we just write k squared, no absolute value. And then you're moving this shifted window over this. Okay, this is great. This is just k squared convolved with f, well, f absolute squared. So this is the inner integral. Now, left hand side is the, this, this outer integral is now this integral here. And we have uh, the inner integral was a convolution. So we have to say, well, it's an integral, again, a scalar product constant one against this. Well, it's a bit sloppy or just write it as an integral. Uh, and now we, I'm saying, well, we have seen and we use these uh, rules that we have already established. It's the distribution introduced by the function constant one applied to this. But, uh, if we apply it to a convolution integral, we could also do it on the function here. So we have to just convolve this distribution or actually the function constant one with this function k squared. But uh, we know that convolving, now the trick is again to commute, I mean to, to replace uh, things that we know already with things that we want to have. So whether I'm saying I'm convolving the distribution generated by the constant function, or I just take the constant function convolved with, uh, with this function k square, then you get constant one, just because the integral is one um, by assumption. So I'm getting sigma one of f hat, and this is of course just the integral over this function, and that's the energy in, of the function f. Okay, now, the next thing is that we can apply plus rel. And here you get a product is going to convolution. X is going to, I mean, translation is going to modulation. And I call phi the free transform of our window. And F of course is going to F hat and pointwise multiplication to convolution. And consequently, we can say that uh, F, that's now this right-hand side is the left-hand side, but the left-hand side, the integral, this one replaced by this one here. And if you spell out what this means is, then you can uh, find immediately that you can get uh, the isometric property. Um, I think uh, that we can take a short break and I will resume here, but explaining or pointing out, roughly speaking, what uh, we can do with this adjoint so that the adjoint has a particular form and that with this particular form, we get the reconstruction formula. So let's take a short break uh, and I 